So The Sims 3 recently went on sale on Origin, which never happens. I've had a few packs from that game that I've always been interested in trying, so I picked a few up and I've been playing around with them for the last few days. In doing so, I was once again confronted by the differences between The Sims 3 and The Sims 4. Today, I want to compare the main aspects of these two iterations of The Sims series, with the goal being to draw some kind of conclusion about which game is more worth putting money into. I say this because these games can get ridiculously expensive with how much DLC they have. Also, with The Sims 4 coming up on being six and a half years old, I thought it'd be fun to generally reflect on both these games, to get a little bit retrospective, if you will. This will definitely be a longer video. The Sim series is something I could talk about for hours, so I'll put timestamps and chapters down below so you can skip around if there are certain parts of this video you'd prefer to listen to. One thing I'd like to do before we get into this video properly is to set out some disclaimers. So for just a little bit of context about me and my history with The Sims series, I started playing from about midway through the life cycle of The Sims 3, and ever since then I've been a massive fan of the series. I do not buy every DLC pack, but I'll purchase ones that I'm interested in. Any criticisms of either game I make are not intended to be an attack on the individual developers, but more the EA overlords who are higher up and making these bigger decisions. Secondly, the opinions I put forward in this video are subjective, and I will be chiming in with my own opinions about aspects of these games throughout this video. At the end of the day, what I would consider to be a great DLC pack, game aspect, etc. for either game might be somebody else's least favourite or worst nightmare. It totally depends on the style of gameplay different people prefer. I personally really enjoy playing Regs to Riches style gameplay with the aim being to make as much money as I can from nothing, but I know other players prefer to use the games purely as building simulators for example. And finally, I will undoubtedly miss some things in this video. Both of these games with all the DLC installed are massive, so I won't hit everything, but if you guys come up with anything extra to add to any of my points or want to debate anything, please leave them below. So finally, with all of that out the way, let's get into this video. When starting a new save file, the first area of the games you are thrown into is Create a Sim, also known as Cass. So on the surface, Cass in The Sims 4 is obviously superior. The ability to click and drag body parts enables so much more freedom in customization than the sliders of The Sims 3 did. However, one area where the sliders from The Sims 3 excelled was in the skin tone department. The Sims has always been a franchise centered around playing with life, including your own. So being able to represent yourself accurately is obviously a massive part of that. After protest from Simmers and EA Game Changers, it was only in December of 2020 that The Sims team gave us an update which brought over 100 new skin tones to The Sims 4, along with sliders to make further adjustments to them. However, the launch of these was far from flawless as many of the pre-existing issues with how skin tones appeared in-game seemed to persist, with the players reporting problems such as blotchiness. The biggest issue with these skin tone additions was how they impacted genetics. If a Sim with dark skin and a sim with lighter skin had a child, the child's skin tone would always come out as the same as the lighter skinned parent. The Sims team quickly addressed this issue with a patch coming out a few days later, but with this being said however, The Sims 3 had skin tone customization right from the start and did not need 6 years post release to fully flesh them out. To give them some credit, back in 2016, The Sims team added gender customization settings to The Sims 4, including whether a sim can get pregnant or not, or even whether they're able to use the toilet sitting or standing. The Sims 3 did not have options like this. The clothing from The Sims 3 is very reflective of the time the game was made, and that's the most positive thing I can say about it. Most hairstyles are also janky at best. The Sims 4 base game isn't much better, but with the DLC, especially packs like Discover University, the clothing and hair situation is improved significantly. Cass is an area which can be improved through custom content for PC players. I could not play The Sims 3 without my CC hairstyles. It's also nice to expand the catalogue of available hairs and clothings in The Sims 4 with custom content, even if the pre-existing selection isn't as offensive off the bat. However, for console players of The Sims 4, downloading custom content is of course not an option. The Sims 3's creator style function gives players the ability to almost fully customise any piece of clothing or nearly anything in build by mode. This function often causes my game to lag significantly and I would say that I don't have a massive amount of CC like some players which may impact that. The colour wheel, which is a part of this function, is something which Sims 4 players have been begging to be brought over for years now. And strangely enough, EA has proved that it is possible with the Sims 4 Cats and Dogs expansion pack. This might be 
encroaching on the DLC section of this video slightly, but it's very annoying that only pets have access to this colour wheel feature, considering how, dare I say, annoying pets are to play with in the game. I've digressed, but the creator style system is something that The Sims 4 base game especially would benefit from. The limited colour swatches of some items can be quite frustrating, but this issue is reduced somewhat with the more clothing and furniture options you have if you've purchased this DLC. It's not an excuse, but it's something to think about. As a side note, one good thing that The Sims 4 cast improved on was the fact that pregnant Sims can wear regular clothes, while in The Sims 3, pregnant Sims change into a randomised outfit which can only be changed if you have certain mods which allow you to do so, and those outfits could be questionable at best. A final element of cast I want to touch on here are traits and aspirations. The Sims 3 has a wealth of traits and aspirations to choose from, which allow you to create diverse Sims who actually feel different. Different. In the base game, The Sims 3 had 63 traits, of which your sim could have 5 each. After the DLC, The Sims 3 offers 99 total traits. In comparison, The Sims 4 base game includes 56, and after all the DLC, which has currently been released, includes 72 traits. The Sims 4, however, only allows adult sims to have a total of 3 traits, with one extra trait being dictated by the category of the aspiration you select. More traits can also be unlocked during gameplay in both games, but I'll discuss this more in a later section of this video. Overall, I find that traits in The Sims 4 do very little to separate each sim to make them feel individual. For me, in my own gameplay, the process of having a sim stand out purely comes from my perception of that sim and the experiences I've had with them. But it's very rare that I get super attached to a sim, and I think this could largely be attributed to the lack of individuality between sims which is caused by the bland trait system. I may even go as far as to say that this is the reason why I typically never play more than one generation in a Sims 4 save file, because I just don't have that attachment. Just before we move on, I do want to give the Sims team some credit and note that while I was writing the script for this video, an update came out which adjusted quite a few of the base game traits to be a little bit more realistic and to differentiate them more somewhat. While I haven't had much of a chance to play around with these changes yet myself, it's a good step in the right direction. Aspirations, or lifetime wishes in The Sims 3, differ quite a lot between both games. Functionally, in The Sims 4, aspirations are broken into four tiers, with tasks within each tier gradually increasing in difficulty. You get a reward trait after completing an aspiration and are encouraged to choose a new aspiration after you've completed one. In The Sims 3, you select one lifetime wish, which will have one or a few pretty lofty goals to hit. Many people have criticised the aspirations added through DLC and The Sims 4 of being like tutorials for the new gameplay features, and I would definitely agree with this to an extent. I think the city living aspiration is a prime example of this. I'm not trying to excuse it, but I think this could be attributed to the structure of The Sims 4 aspiration system and the lack of content which packs come with. Let me explain. The Sims 4 tier system forces the need to cast a wider net of goals to be achieved, which means that for packs which lack a lot of content, most aspects of said pack will most likely be hit within an aspiration. The nature of lifetime wishes in The Sims 3, on the other hand, means that only one or a few utmost goals can be hit within a single lifetime wish, making them much more narrow in focus but with a larger goal to achieve all at once, rather than achieving the goal in stages across the different tiers of an aspiration from The Sims 4. Lifetime wishes, which came with The Sims 3 DLC packs, were quite unique for the most part. For example, one which came with the Pets expansion pack involves collecting two of nearly every type of animal you can have as a pet in the game as though you're building a pixelated Noah's Ark. You do, of course, get some of the more standard hit the top of this career or master this skill ones, but I think The Sims 3 has a good mix of standard lifetime wishes and some of the more fun ones, like see the ghost of a wealthy spouse or the create three monsters one, which came with the Ambitions expansion pack. I think that in The Sims 3, completing a lifetime wish felt pretty significant, like it actually held some weight in a Sims life. I'm not sure why I don't completely get that same feeling in The Sims 4. Again, maybe it's because of the tier structure of the aspiration system, which has you incrementally achieving pretty similar goals to those in Sims 3, rather than getting one big hurrah at the end for completing the singular goal. I want to point out here that I don't actually dislike the tiered aspiration system of The Sims 4. Especially when I first started playing the game when it came out, it was nice to have some smaller goals to hit as you were getting started with your first few households. And when you are a more experienced player, some of the top tier goals and some of the aspirations still pose a challenge to me today. For example, in the public enemy aspiration in which you have to witness the death of a sim. Overall, if I had to pick a favourite system between both games, I don't 
don't think I'd be able to. I don't know, the feelings of satisfaction I get from the systems in either game are just different. So, with the worlds, the most obvious difference between the games is the fact that in The Sims 3 you have open worlds, but in The Sims 4 you don't. In my opinion, the open nature of The Sims 3 was one of its biggest strengths in general, and conversely, the closed nature of The Sims 4 is one of its biggest drawbacks. While The Sims 4 allows you to visit every world you have installed in your game without the use of mods, unlike The Sims 3, it's something I hardly ever want to do because of the fact that you have to go through a loading screen. So as a result, I hardly ever leave my lot unless it's for an inverted commas event, like going to a restaurant for a Sims birthday or to go to a festival, for example. I hardly ever leave just to explore somewhere new. Another reason why I'm less likely to leave my lot in The Sims 4 is because of the fact that I like to micromanage my Sims. As I mentioned earlier, my favourite style of gameplay is making as much money as I can, improving my sims as much as I can. The Sims 4 makes it difficult to do this. I can't have one sim at home gardening, for example, and have another sim go to the gym. I know you have that little icon where you can select very generally what your sim should do while you leave them alone, but I find this doesn't work half the time. I don't have this issue at all in The Sims 3, and in fact, I have my sims leave their home lot all the time because I have that freedom. One negative mood lit you can get in The Sims 3 is stir crazy if you stay on your home lot for too long. I can't help but wonder, if this were introduced to The Sims 4, whether it would be enough to push me to leave my home lot more, or whether it would just be too much of an annoyance. It's not all bad for The Sims 4, however, as I do appreciate how the game allows you to move to any world pretty easily, and that all the worlds coexist together, even if it is a little bit unrealistic that a loading screen can take you to a blisteringly hot desert to a snowy mountain in about 20 seconds. The system allows you to control multiple households in one save file really easily, which I enjoy. I find that the most fun I've had with The Sims 4 was when I played with many households in one save file and had them all interact and intersect. I guess that's just me trying to compensate for how empty The Sims 4 worlds really feel, especially in terms of the pre-made sims in them who feel as dry and dusty as that last digestive biscuit you left in the packet a year ago because you thought you'd really appreciate it being there one day. Just me. They feel so one-dimensional. Their household bios might indicate that there's a lot of lore around them, for example. They might have a feud with another family, but then you head into the household only to find that they have absolutely no relationship with the other people mentioned in the bio. It's pretty disappointing. The lore between families in The Sims 3, on the other hand, runs deeper than just the household description. For example, the Sim Agnes Crumpelbottom has a pretty deep backstory. The ghost of her dead husband haunts her house, allowing players to resurrect him if they so choose. And beyond that, her house is a somewhat unsettling half-built nursery, leaving players to decide for themselves what happened. Heading back to The Sims 4, Sims' abilities to move so freely between worlds can be super jarring sometimes, especially when you have some of the more super supernatural inspired packs installed. Like, seeing the pink spellcaster chick wandering around the spice district of San Myshuno can be very strange. Or seeing a five-star celebrity walking into a small country pub in the middle of Glimmerbrook is also pretty immersion-destroying. The Sims 4 feels like the world revolves around your sim, in which other people just exist. While in The Sims 3, it feels like you've just rolled up to a new town and you have to find your place in it, if that makes sense. And on this note, The Sims 3 worlds feel so immersive. This might just be coming from a place of nostalgia, but Moonlight Falls, the world which came with the Supernatural expansion pack, has to be my favourite world, even though a lot of people would probably say it's one of the blandest to be added. The mysterious small town vibes are just so immersive to me, and what can I say, I'm a sucker for a Twilight reference. It has always felt very cosy to me, and like it's filled with secrets I want to uncover. I've never connected anywhere near that much with The Sims 4 world. One more factor which detracts from the immersion of The Sims 4 has to be the size of the worlds. So the two starter worlds, Willow Creek and Oasis Springs, has a combined total of 42 lots, bearing in mind that's across two worlds, while Sunset Valley, The Sims 3 base game world, has 92. While The Sims 4 looked like they were going to be improving on this situation when they released the Get Together expansion pack, which introduced the fairly large world of Windenburg, which had 27 lots, it seemed that this was a one-off, as other new worlds seemed to fall on the small side, like Del Sol Valley from the Get Famous expansion pack, which introduced a measly 11 lots. 
or Mount Komarebi from the Snow Escape expansion pack, which had only 14 lots. It's always such a joy returning to The Sims 3 and getting to experience that freedom of a large open world again. In the same vein, if you enjoy similar gameplay styles to me, especially the rags to riches style, The Sims 3 does a far better job at letting you feel like you're really living off the land. When I kick off a new rags to riches challenge in The Sims 3, it's so much fun plopping down my own new lot away from all the other houses, because yes, The Sims 3 does in fact have a world editor, then running around the entire map scouring for collectibles which feels so much more integrated into the landscape, unlike The Sims 4 where it feels like giant rocks just pop up from any old place. In The Sims 3, the collectible system is expanded with DLC packs like Seasons, which introduces wildflowers which can be picked, or the Pets expansion, which introduces small animals like snakes or birds which can be collected and sold. Aside from collecting, another skill I frequently use at the start of a rags to riches challenge is fishing. It's so much fun in The Sims 3 to be able to run from a river to the ocean to a lake nestled within a hilltop, completely uninterrupted by a loading screen. There's one final teeny tiny detail I want to bring up, and that's that every Sims 4 townie is really ugly. I think you guys know what I mean, so let's not dwell on it and just move on. One last thing I want to talk about before we get into the actual gameplay is build and buy mode. The Sims 4 is hands down undoubtedly superior in this aspect. Unless you have a stupidly massive house filled to the brim with objects, build buy runs as smooth as butter, at least on the machine that I'm using. I can't say the same for build buy mode in The Sims 3, which can get pretty laggy for me at times, especially when I start messing around with the creator style tool that I mentioned earlier. This is frustrating because I can be quite an indecisive builder and I like to take my time trying out different things, but in The Sims 3 I always want to get out of that mode as quickly as I possibly can and usually end up living in pre-made homes of which I'll only make a few minor adjustments to. However, there is something about the aesthetic of houses in The Sims 3 which looks so much more realistic than the buildings of The Sims 4, which often look frozen in a state of squeaky clean and brand new. That realistic, lived-in vibe from The Sims 3 is something I always try and replicate in The Sims 4 where I can. I haven't mentioned the wildly different visual styles of both games yet, so I suppose I'll very briefly put it here. I personally prefer the visual style of The Sims 3, but I appreciate the clean look of The Sims 4 too. I think it totally comes down to personal preference. The build by objects of The Sims 4 are also far better to those in The Sims 3, but again, that might be more down to the time in which The Sims 3 was in development, what builds and decoration styles were more popular at the time, etc. It has gotten to the point where the items which a pack brings to The Sims 4 can have an impact on my decision to buy a new DLC pack sometimes. But I do have to mention that the swatch system of The Sims 4 does hold it back quite a lot, as it can be difficult to mix and match items from different packs if they don't have coordinating swatches. I find this especially the case for items which are made of wood. Conversely, while the creator style function of The Sims 3 gives you the opportunity to match everything to anything, it can cause some overwhelm for me at times. I'm not saying that I prefer the swatch system of The Sims 4, but I hope in The Sims 5 they find a happy medium between the two. The Sims 4 does allow for more flexibility in other areas of build by, however. For example, by giving us the freedom to place objects anywhere we want on a wall, placing windows and doors has also become a much more flexible process. One small thing I think The Sims 3 by mode does better than The Sims 4 is foliage. It sounds strange, but I think that many of the trees and bushes and flowers in The Sims 4 look very plastic and manicured. There's also not enough variation in the ones we have available, in my opinion. Foliage in The Sims 3, however, looks far more natural and realistic, like it has actually grown from the ground, but this could be attributed to the art style of the game in general. The Sims 4 build mode has also been improved significantly over time, with additional features being added including a platform tool and terrain manipulation tools for example. I want to focus on the last one I mentioned there for a second. While the terrain manipulation tool has allowed some creators to make some insane builds, I often struggle to use the tool in a way which allows the builds I'm working on to blend with the surroundings, which is important to me. It's clear the world in the game before the tool came out were just not made to accommodate it sometimes. I think it can look a little bit strange when you're in a neighbourhood which is pretty flat and all the lots in it are flat, then you get a bit jazzy with the terraforming on your lot. Maybe this is just a personal gripe though, but you really don't have this issue in The Sims 3, as a lot of the worlds include hills, uneven ground and everything like that. The worlds feel dynamic. 
One other thing I wish they brought to The Sims 4 with the terraforming update was the pond tool from The Sims 3, which lets you make actual, natural ponds, rather than the baby swimming pools that The Sims 3 are currently trying to masquerade as a pond. Okay, it's time to get into the actual game. Between both games, the day-to-day -day gameplay is pretty much the same. You manage the needs of your sims while they go to work or find other ways to make money, while they build relationships and gradually make a life for themselves. One of the biggest selling points of The Sims 4 was the emotion system. I personally would absolutely not miss it one bit if they did away with this in The Sims 5. In a way, it feels like The Sims team only somewhat committed to this aspect as, in my opinion, emotions are far too easily to manipulate and negative emotions are far too easy to circumvent. It almost makes sims feel a little bit fickle sometimes. Just got the news that your dad, who was your best friend, passed away? No problem, cry out in bed for a few hours and you'll have forgotten all about this tremendous loss in your life. If you need to be in a certain emotion to gain extra skill boosts, chances are you can buy a lamp or a potion, or once you've been in the mood once, you can paint an emotional painting to capture it forever and to have a constant emitter of that emotional aura. It's way too easy. But at the same time, knowing me, I'd also complain if the emotion system were too difficult to influence. Lot traits are also something which can impact emotions or skill gains, as well as other aspects in The Sims 4. I think that lot traits were an amazing addition to the game actually, having been introduced in the patch for all players which came out the City Living expansion pack. In a Sims 4 series I uploaded to this channel a little while ago, I played around with the off the grid lot trait and I had a lot of fun with it. It added a nice amount of challenge but one downside to it is that I think you really benefit from having the eco lifestyle expansion pack installed, as the items which came with it made it a much more rounded experience in my opinion. There are plenty of other lot traits which have minor impacts on gameplay, like like the ones which make ghosts spawn or which cause appliances on your lot to break frequently. Being able to apply three of these to a lot at a time and the ability to constantly change them I suppose somewhat makes up for the fact that I barely leave my home lot. While we're back on traits, let's discuss those which can be unlocked or purchased during gameplay. In The Sims 4, these are called satisfaction reward traits and in 3, they are called lifetime rewards. In both games, these traits include ones which make the game easier, for example by reducing individual need to decay or increasing the rate of skill gain among other things. For the most part in The Sims 4, that's just about all the options, with only a few fun different ones like the money tree seed which was introduced with the seasons expansion pack. The Sims 3 on the other hand introduces plenty of really unique ones, like having clones of your sim in child form or a sim bot join your household, or even the ability to tame the kraken. Pets even have a list of specific lifetime rewards they can buy. In The Sims 4 you can also get reward traits from completing aspirations, which I think is a great idea, but again, implemented pretty poorly, and some of the rewards lack sense or usefulness. I'll again bring up the city native aspiration from the city living expansion pack. This aspiration requires you to live in an apartment worth 100,000 simoleons, and the reward is reduced prices at food stands in the city. If you're already that rich in the game, it just doesn't make sense. Plenty of other aspiration rewards involve having the ability to manipulate other Sims emotions which, as we've already established, can be done through many other ways. As I've mentioned, my favourite style of gameplay is making as much money as I can, mastering as many skills as I can. I do like family-centred gameplay though too. Let's just get the glaring issue with The Sims 4 and family gameplay out the way. Why did we have to wait until January 2017, two years and four months approximately after the game was released, for toddlers to be introduced? It absolutely beats me. Did EA really think they could get away with players just being satisfied with their babies transforming into 10 year olds? In The Sims 3, toddlers offered some pretty challenging gameplay, especially if you had multiple at a time, such as in a 100 baby challenge playthrough. I'm glad we finally got them in 2017, but I cannot get my head around why we had to wait that long. I also still prefer toddlers from The Sims 3, honestly, as in The Sims 4, I still fairly often run into bugs with them, like them not being able to eat food unless they're in a high chair. It makes me resort to cheating their needs because I don't want them to get taken away, and I prefer to not cheat during gameplay when I can, as I want to maintain that element of challenge. 
one gameplay element from The Sims 3 I wish would return to The Sims 4 is the real estate and property owning system. It was a really unobtrusive feature and a fun side hustle for up and coming Sims. It allowed you to buy commercial properties in a town, then improve them and profit from them each day. While through some DLC like Get to Work, you can own and run retail lots in The Sims 4, this was more like being able to own the local grocery store or gym. I feel like having this feature in The Sims 4 would help the world feel a little bit more lived in and less dollhouse like. It could even be expanded on, with rich families like the land grabs already owning some properties when you'd boot up a new save file. I feel like this would be a really fun way of customising worlds in a save file even more, especially as The Sims 4 lacks the advanced world editing tools from The Sims 3. Another pretty big thing The Sims 4 is missing from 3 is built-in story progression. This is the system of Sims outside your household having their own lives, growing up, building or losing relationships, having children and gaining skills among other things. I think this was a feature which really made the worlds in The Sims 3 feel alive. For example, I recently got the Pets expansion pack and wanted to go to the neighbourhood's local adoption place, but the few times I tried, the guy who lived in the house where the adoption place was at was out. He was living his own life. I had to work around him. In The Sims 4, other than Sims in other households aging if the setting is enabled, we have no system like this. If you want to invite a Sim out on a date, there's about a 99% chance that they will say yes and that they'll see you there immediately. A few years into The Sims 4's life cycle, small random events were introduced, in which someone your Sim knew would invite you out on an excursion, like going to an opera or a circus, but your Sim just disappears. That's it, they come back a few hours later and you just have to imagine that they had a good time. I know that the MC Command Center mod introduces a story progression system, but that means only PC players have access to it. And even then, not all players are comfortable with trying mods. I know I wasn't for a long time. Again, I hope this is something they fix in The Sims 5. So let's talk about socializing and getting outside. In both games, building relationships, both platonic and romantic, are fairly easy, I'd say. You just have to keep on top of them as relationship levels can decrease over time. Visiting community lots are pretty different experiences in both games, however. In The Sims 4, returning to this idea that the world revolves around your sim, it's really funny to see the line of people who suddenly run right into the lot you've just arrived at. It's nice seeing lots populated, however. In The Sims 3, on the other hand, whether a lot has people on it or not can vary quite a lot. I usually always find people in the park, and while I was messing around with the Island Paradise expansion, I could always find people staying at resorts whether that was the one my family owned or another one. But then you could turn up to other lots and find it to be a ghost town. I can't tell whether I prefer that feeling I get in The Sims 4. That being that everyone else in the town seems to have some kind of tracking device on you and will drop everything the second they see you leave their home, just to get a glimpse of you. I almost forgot to mention this, but with the free patch which came out with the Snow Escape expansion pack for The Sims 4, all players got sentiments. These denote how sims feel towards one another and can be based off of relationships or experiences they share together. I think these were actually a really great addition and helped make different relationships feel unique. As some sentiments are long term and others are short term, they also make relationships feel dynamic as they change over time. Both base games are somewhat similar in the skills and careers they offer. The Sims 4 base game has 20 skills for adult sims and after DLC, which is currently available, there are 35 in total. The Sims 3 base game only offered half of those skills at 10 and after DLC, there were 32 as well as three available for only pets to learn. One way in which the skill system of The Sims 3 varied was the addition of the skill journal. This included additional skill-based challenges which Sims could complete to get rewards, for example, being able to finish paintings quicker, of course in relation to the painting skill. I think The Sims 4 could benefit from a feature like this too, just to give players more things to do. While we're on skills, I really appreciate The Sims team updating the gardening skill when the Seasons expansion pack came out for The Sims 4. This is a skill that I use very frequently and I really appreciate the added depth and complexity. I also like how the skill was expanded by the Seasons expansion pack and I wish this was something they'd carry forward to other skills, especially those from the base game and those which players use most. This is because some skills, mostly those which are profitable like painting or writing, can get super repetitive sometimes. It would be nice to see some variation added to those in some way. So this gameplay section is much smaller than I anticipated it to be and I'm undoubtedly missing some things but I'm trying to stick to the base games only at this point because now we're moving on to DLC. 
there's a lot of variation in the volume and forms of DLC both games offer. The Sims 3 offered two forms of DLC, expansion packs, of which there were 11, and the far smaller stuff packs, of which there were 9. The Sims 3 also had an online store, where anything from individual items to entire new worlds or gameplay sets could be purchased, or the currency called Sim Points. I'll get back to this in a little while. With The Sims 4, as of March 2021, when this video is being written, there are 10 expansion packs, 9 game packs, which offer a smaller but more focused gameplay experience, and a whopping 18 stuff packs, and EA have just started rolling out an even smaller form of DLC called kits, which offer bite-sized pieces of content varying from new clothing sets, smaller furniture sets, and even a minor gameplay mechanic like hoovering. Luckily, Sims 4 DLC goes on sale fairly often, so if you're a mega fan of the series and want to buy every pack, this is made a little bit easier. Across all of these add-ons for both games, there is a stupid amount of content to cover, so instead of discussing each one in turn, I want to talk about them more generally. Firstly, I want to mention how I think it's fun that the Sims team have been mixing up the themes of DLC they've been offering. Like the Spa Day game pack in The Sims 4 is actually one of my favourites, and to my knowledge we haven't seen anything like that in previous games. But with that being said, not everything new The Sims team try lands, like the Journey to the Two game pack. EA, we get it. You want to milk the Star Wars IP of every last drop you can, but please never do anything like this to us again. But with that said, in my opinion, the game pack team is one of the best working on The Sims 4. I'm hardly ever disappointed when I buy a new one, and I often find that I get an equal or even more enjoyment out of them than the full expansion packs. The reason The Sims 4 team introduced kits, as far as we've been told, is so the devs could add smaller, more bite-sized pieces of content more frequently, i.e. not having to include them in a larger pack. In a live stream, some members of The Sims team noted how kits were meant to act like a buffet for players. You can pick and choose which ones most fit your gameplay style and those which appeal most to your interests. Circling back to The Sims 3 store then, I actually wouldn't mind something like this for The Sims 4, but with regular currency instead of the sim point system. I think that a platform like this would be a great place for kits, or rather the content which come with kits to be sold from. I'm not sure if anyone else feels the same way to me, or gets what I mean, but the way kits are currently sold feels almost like they're just another pack, or more that they carry the same amount of weight as a new pack release does, which doesn't sit right with me for some reason. Going back to the Sims 3 store, I've never actually purchased anything from it myself, but it had a specific sale section as well as a rotating daily deal section which I've actually had my eye on a lot, while waiting for some of the more expensive sets to get discounted. There are some sets on that which bring new skills and new skill items, like the Prism Art Studio, which introduces the artisan skill and the glass blowing station. This is one I really want, as any new way to make money from a skill is right up my alley. They also had a bakery set which introduced the baking skill. This is one which I loved playing with in The Sims 4 when it was introduced with the Get to Work expansion pack. There's something about the look of the stove which comes with that Sims 3 store set which is so appealing to me. I even found a custom content conversion of it for The Sims Sims 4, but I remember it not working in my game for some reason, which was quite disappointing. Finally, there's even a Sims 3 store set which introduces a canning station to make preserves out of harvestables. This kind of multi-stage process which builds on pre-existing skills really appeals to me, and I'd love to get a chance to play around with it someday. But anyway, moving on, I do like how The Sims team is getting the community more involved in The Sims 4. For example, a few surveys have come out over the years which have dictated or influenced packs which have come out, like the Laundry Day Stuff Pack, Knitting Stuff, and I believe also the Eco Lifestyle and Snowy Escape expansion packs. Speaking of Snowy Escape, The Sims team even invited four prominent Sims content creators to build houses and community lots for the world of Mount Komarebi, which came with that pack. I think this is an amazing step in the right direction, considering considering how awful some of the builds which have come with previous worlds really have been. Okay, now it's rant time. The biggest issue I have with DLC in The Sims 4, and I know I'm not the only one who feels this way, is the general process of The Sims team giving us a pack which we've seen in a previous game, like a seasons or university centered pack, but then cutting half the content we got from the previous iteration, often resulting in a shallow and unfulfilling experience overall. We've seen this trend occur time and time again, and I'm getting tired of it. The most glaring example of this, in my opinion, can be seen with the Tropical Getaway expansion pack. 
Netflix, and The Sims 3 being Island Paradise, and in The Sims 4 being Island Living. You can just tell that most of the budget for Island Living went into the world of Sulani, and from what I've seen of the world, it looks beautiful. Full transparency here, I don't actually own this pack myself, but I've watched a good few review and let's play videos based around it. However, while the pack introduces some similar features to the Island Paradise expansion of The Sims 3, they seem to be shallow and cut back. Take snorkeling and scuba diving for example, which were a full skill in The Sims 3. You could go to diving spots out in the deep ocean once your level was high enough, then go to underwater areas to pick up collectibles, from small sea creatures to shells to even finding treasure chests. Heck, you could even get beaten up by sharks or meet mermaids down there. In The Sims 4, however, snorkeling and scuba diving has been tied to the fitness skill, and there are none of those fun underwater areas to explore anymore, with them simply reduced to rabbit hole locations. Speaking of mermaids, other supernatural occult sims introduced in Sims 4 game packs, like vampires and spellcasters, have had great progression and leveling systems, which means that you can make each sim feel different. Mermaids from Island Living have nothing like that. You just have all the powers and are the same as every other mermaid on the island. But aside from that, Island Living did not bring back the resort system from The Sims 3, which was pretty disappointing to me as I've had a lot of fun playing around with that recently. With the retail mechanics introduced with other packs already, I can't get my head around why this didn't make a return. I probably should have brought this up earlier, but I want to make it clear that I'm not expecting an exact replica of the same content in every similarly themed pack, or even in every single Sims game in general. But when previous iterations of either are really good and packed with content, they set up an expectation. I don't think it's a stretch to want the same level, if not more content, in the newest iteration of a pack or game. I don't want to get too conspiratorial up in here, but I think that this is why, in part, Sims 3 expansion packs nearly never go on sale, at least on Origin. EA know that their old shit is hotter than what they're trying to serve us now. And I want to point out here that that's absolutely not to say that I hate every pack in The Sims 4 which we've seen previously. I actually really enjoyed the University expansion pack for example, but maybe that's because I haven't personally played The Sims 3 University life. And I think that The Sims 4 Seasons was great, and I can't imagine my game without it. But like I said, it's just frustrating sometimes having played the older games. While I could continue this comparison between similarly themed DLC packs, I again think that this would take a stupid amount of time to go through each one individually. But if you guys would like to see an in-depth comparison between any two packs, please let me know in the comments down below and I'd be more than happy to do some. As you guys have already seen, I love talking about this game. So with that being said, I want to move on to discuss how DLC impacts the longevity of each Sims game. What I found from The Sims 4 is that every time a new pack comes out that I'm interested in, I'll buy it, now most likely when it goes on sale, then play it for a few days, most likely in combination with something like a rags to riches challenge, then I'll stop playing it for a few months until I either get the itch to play again, or a new pack comes out and the cycle continues. Maybe it's just my attention span, but sometimes I'll buy a new pack and not even fully explore it because the loop established by many of the new mechanics, especially retail related ones for example, just isn't captivating enough. Or alternatively, the mechanics just don't work very well and the frustration gets the better of me. I think this can be seen pretty well in the retail stores introduced with the Get to Work expansion. Trying to convince customers to buy things takes way too much time for the value you get in return quite often. Like, I'd absolutely love to run a cafe. Like I mentioned earlier, the baking skill is something I've enjoyed building in quite a few playthroughs. But the fact that I have to stand talking to a customer sometimes for an hour or more to convince them to buy one pie is not fun at all. It's just a mechanic which could have been great if a little more thought and time had been put into developing it. I think the expansion packs from The Sims 3 did a far better job at implementing new gameplay features which just seem to blend into the base game really well. There are so many little aspects added through expansion packs and it can sometimes be difficult to remember which one came from where. And I actually think that's a good thing. I haven't played with it for a good few years, but I remember the Generations expansion pack being a great example of this. I feel the absence of many features which came with that pack now that I don't have it installed in my game. It was like parents teaching their teenagers how to drive, or having tree houses for children to play in, or dare I even say bunk beds, which were added to The Sims 4 mere days ago. So what does all this have to do with longevity? Expansion packs in The Sims 3 create, for the most part, a really cohesive game, one which feels like one really big game, rather than the feeling I sometimes get from The Sims 4. That being that it feels like lots of smaller games being violently smashed together. 
Again, thinking back to the spellcasters being seen wandering around cities, for example. And again, please don't think that I'm entirely hating on The Sims 4 here, because they have had some hits. As I mentioned, I would struggle to go back to the game if I didn't have seasons installed. But I think the way that DLC impacts the day-to-day -day gameplay in The Sims 3 makes me want to play one family for way longer. I've actually been playing one Sims 3 save file with the same family on and off for probably a few years now. I'm a good few generations in. But like I mentioned earlier, however, with The Sims 4, I often don't play past the first generation of a family because I just get bored with them. One final thing I want to touch on before we wrap this video up and draw some conclusions is custom content, also known as CC, and mods which could be considered unofficial free DLC made by community members. They both come in many forms, but CC for the most part are cosmetic things like clothing, hairs, makeup, skin tones, furniture items, and in The Sims 3, players could even make entire worlds. I've messed around with a few by a creator called My Sims Realty and they were awesome. Hairs and makeup are the areas I like to get CC in most, just any way to make my sims look cuter and I'm there. Mods are something I've messed around with a little bit in both games. The NRAS mods created for The Sims 3 are amazing and I'll never play without them because they just give you so much freedom over more aspects of the game. Want to have more than 8 sims in a household? No problem. Want to move to a new town and not forget everyone you have ever known? Consider it done. I haven't experimented too much with mods for The Sims 4, but most recently I tried the playable pets mod, which gives you the ability to control your cats and dogs. This was an absolute game changer for me, as I actually really disliked the fact that in The Sims 4 you can't directly control your pets. The Sims team claimed that this was meant to be for realism, but part of me thinks it was either a lack of budget or time. Anyway, that mod is fantastic and I recommend it to anyone who also dislikes the lack of control over pets. If you're looking to extend your enjoyment of a Sims game, I highly recommend dabbling in mods and CC, as there is so much out there that you'll definitely find something that tickles your interest. I'll say though, definitely watch some tutorials on how to get them set up if you're new to modding games like I was, and always be careful with what and where you're downloading from. Internet safety is key, people. So then, with my internet safety PSA out the way, we are coming up on nearly the 8,500 word mark for this script, so I'd better start wrapping this video up. If we had to come to a conclusion on which game is best for you and which you may want to put more money into DLC wise, I think there are a few things we need to consider here. Firstly, what are you playing on? Less powerful laptops and PCs definitely benefit from The Sims 4, but with minimal DLC and custom content, I think The Sims 3 can run on lower powered machines fine nowadays. But stay away from Isla Paradiso, the worlds from the Island Paradise expansion pack, as it caused me a lot of lag, even though I'd consider my laptop to be fairly powerful. Be aware too that The Sims 3 generally has pretty long loading times when you boot up the game or when you want to save, unlike The Sims 4. But conversely, it doesn't have loading screens every time you want to go to a new lot. Swings and roundabouts, I guess. Secondly, you should consider the style of gameplay you might prefer. For Rex Twitch's fans like me, I find this a way more fun experience in The Sims 3, because of the open world and how collectibles feel so integrated into those worlds. It feels so much more satisfying to make those first few simoleons when you've ran all over the world in one day to find collectibles to sell to make them. For players who just love to build, on the other hand, The Sims 4 is hands down the best route to go down. For family style players, it gets a bit more complicated. The Sims 3 has its built-in story progression system, meaning that the world your family exists in feels more lived in, and any family members who move out can embark on their own lives out of your control, which can be really fun to see. I think, however, that if you're interested in playing with multiple families in one save file, then The Sims 4 is much friendlier for that. And finally, this one is quite subjective, but how much and how long do you intend to play for at a time. Totally, in my opinion, The Sims 4 is a very shallow experience, but playing through most things once can be really fun. I'd say The Sims 4 is best for players who want to play for a few hours on the weekend at most here and there, but for players who have more time to sink in, I'd say go for three. While I say this though, The Sims 4 can have a lot of time put into it as we see. I've personally put in just under 2,500 hours. So while I've somewhat attempted to answer this long-standing question within the Sims community of which Sims game is better, through this comparison format, I think it's pretty impossible to definitively and unanimously come to a decision because ultimately everyone has their own opinions. Some will be diehard for The Sims 4 and other will feel the same about 3. It will however be very interesting to see how The Sims team goes forward into the development of The Sims 5, which we'll hopefully see within the next few years. Despite this video's lack of a definitive conclusion, 
conclusion. I hope you found this video useful and if not then just entertaining. I certainly had fun at putting on my retrospective hat and taking a look at both games side by side. Once again, if there's anything I missed or anything you disagree with or agree with for that matter, please by all means put it in the comments down below. I'd love to hear all of your opinions and to continue this discussion. So yes, that's everything that I've got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you're having a great day. Happy simming and I'll see you again soon.